Swing it and sword it. Let's get that booty. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Slim Cog Cast. This is me, Slim Cognito, and unfortunately, I am black. Now, here we are for the 10th episode. I want to say congratulations because we got to celebrate our small milestones so we can get to our bigger ones. So I am very proud to announce that we have reached 10 episodes. That makes two and a half months. So round of applause for us because I can't do this without you all. And if at least one person loves it, at least four people, at least two people, however many it is, then I enjoy it and I'll keep doing it now. Let's hop right on in. Uh, first thing I want to let you guys know that I will not be covering an anime this week because I decided to catch up on my reading backlog. And there's a comic book that I started but have yet to finish. And I was about, oh, say, 30 or 40 issues in and I haven't finished when it's only the first part. I think it's about 50 or so or 52 issues. So um, on the on that note, I've been reading the Mega Man Archie comic series and it just oozes with soul it is so good it's like the best if it was animated into a complete show cartoon it would be one of the best shows I've ever seen with the Mega Man IP attached to it it is so good if you're a fan of the original works of Mega Man from the NES days all the way up to even his terrible times you know that this is for you know that this is for you okay i i can't stress it enough like there was it's, it's even the fact that not only in the first wave of uh, robot masters that he fights you know either they go through the origin story they don't even spend much time on it you know they get right down to it because if you're reading this you know who Mega Man is and if you if you don't know who Mega Man is they give you all the information right then and there in a tasteful little package so it's not confusing or too deep and you're set off you go and Mega Man becomes a fighting a super fighting robot here's the kicker when you um get started with the robot masters and he starts to go out to destroy them and fight them the clever thing that they do is they order them by their weapon weaknesses so he goes to each one based off of who's easier to tackle or defeat and then use those weaknesses against one another to defeat them and it's great each robot and robot master and character has their own separate personalities and logical standpoints they make completely sound logical decisions and it's it's just great how they interact with one another, even the robot masters especially. Um, you have moments where um, after you get to the Mega Man 2 robot masters and you defeat them, which would be like, you know, uh, Flash Man, Quick Man and Wood Man, etc. You know, and once he defeat those um, and there's a little plot thing in between there. After that's over, the interlude in between before they go into the third wave of Robot Masters, which would be Mega Man 3, Mega Man's decommissioned for one issue. And during that time, they have an anime moment where Roll, um, Dr. Cossack's uh, daughter, and um, what was the name of the other doctor? Um, it's another uh, doctor who uh, does robotics and studies geography. And and uh, I forget the the name for uh, the study of rocks, uh, specific rocks. But yes, yeah, that's what she does. And she built a robot specifically for those functions named Quake. And uh, all three of these girls, uh, being the two robot girls and the human girl, uh, decided to go on a beach vacation and just have fun in the sun, which was pretty cool. You know, it's like an anime filler, but this one was actually tasteful because not only it only lasts for one issue two, um, there was a ship that crashed and wrecked and caused an oil spill near the beach, which is questionable. You know, boats that have oil routes that close to uh, civilians, but still um, and all the people. Uh, you know, we're in trouble and there's people drowning off the ship and et cetera. So, you know, who better to help than Roll and the rest of them? So they decide to, uh, you know, try to call Mega Man, but he's not available right now. He's shut down and he's wide open and his parts are all over the place. Now, 
they call in oil man instead to help contain the oil spill and the oil man made his, a decision on upon itself to awaken a, an experimental r robot master that was not activated yet but was not con con you know tampered with by wiley and that was uh dang what was her name was it was it was it aqua woman or water woman something the 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 mermaid looking chick and <laughs> look the mermaid looking chick uh, anyway so yeah they had a little cool moment they all teamed together and saved everybody rush helped out so uh you know they could all get out there and do things and it was it was actually cool quake's character is interesting because she has like a ptsd because her personality was ripped out of her after she was buried in a cave-in and became dysfunctional and ceased to function and now um once her creator uh the other doctor i can't recall learned better and found out it was wrong she she took her personality and emotions away from her because she didn't want her to feel pain or hurt ever again but it was a archaic thing to do and she eventually learned better so she re-implemented her emotions and personality and now they grow and she has to learn to face her fears she developed fear and a ptsd of being buried alive and that and it also triggered when she came across the water in the ocean because she felt it would be the same and she didn't want to drown. But her need to help people was stronger than her fears and whatnot. And I'm not really big on the whole, you know, um, um, you know, everything coddle and cradle mentality type of thing, uh, you know, when it comes to like triggers and trigger warnings and things like this. But this is when it's done well and actually well handled, you know, so. I have to, I have to, have to give credit where it's due. Um, cause not only did they do it in that fashion, but also, um, they show, they didn't shy away from it and they show how much of a better character she became after her emotions were implemented and how she made sense of what happened. And she's understanding the actions of her creator rather than going all crazy, like, um break man aka proto man is doing right now and even they have an interaction later on but uh i won't get into that right now but the point is it's so good and you know eventually they save all the people everybody's fine nobody gets hurt nobody dies and when everything's over and Mega Man's up and running again we finally find out exactly why he was away this entire issue was because they were implementing the slide function on his legs and in his systems so now mega man can do slides which was only possible first it was first possible and was first introduced in mega man 3 makes sense because this filler uh, issue is an integral of Mega Man 2 and 3 so <laughs> that's so good even even Dr. Light mentions um he says um I'm I'm getting real close to getting this slide function fixed but I don't know why it won't work in mode 9 and 10 <laughs> so that's a little nod where um Mega Man 9 and Mega Man 10, which were new releases in 8-bit form, which was a regression from Mega Man 8, but um, it was released in 2008. Mega Man 9 and 10 was released in 2008, and it, was, it went back to the 8-bit art style, but they took out the slide function. There was only jump and shoot, and not everybody was happy about that. Not at all, especially me. I didn't even beat 9 and 10. Like by the time I came across nine and ten, like I was a college student and I sat down expecting more Mega Man, more more Mega Man three with new bosses because that's what four, five, and six felt like. It was just Mega Man three with different bosses and new weapons. That's what it felt like to me. But um, it didn't get different enough until like seven and then eight came along and then suddenly and eight came out like two thousand. No, it came out like ninety eight or ninety nine. And we didn't get another Mega Man until 2008. So that's like almost 20 years until we got a new sequel. And that's insane. So that goes to show you 
that um, this series for a long time has been you know they're they're implementing every little bit that they know about it fan made wise and i like those little tidbits and nods they're doing it real good um Another thing that's very interesting that I have to mention is the inclusion of Proto Man being Breakman while he was under the influence of Wily. But um, one of the key most important things about Proto Man's character was he was never actually reprogrammed by anybody. He was the first robot master, but the only problem he had was, it was two problems. One, he had an existential crisis because he felt that his creator was replacing him with Mega Man. And two, he was, because he was a prototype, his power core was malfunctioning. So at times he would all seize up and, you know, leak power when he didn't want to. And because of such, he often felt that his flaw is what made him who he is and he didn't want anybody to fix him or touch him or anything. But ultimately in the comic, when he when his power core failed, um, Wiley patched him up and found him, but he didn't reprogram him, not physically. He repro he reprogrammed him mentally by telling him, Dr. Light is your enemy and he wants to replace you with Mega Man because you weren't good enough of a son. And now he needed a new son and you're a failure to him. And that was enough for him to say t until he became a villain to Light and the Mega Crew for almost like seven or eight games. So, yeah, and, and that's that's good, actually, because it's rooted very early. He was still young, relatively. He was only about a year or two old. And suddenly everything that he used to do with his so-called father was gone and given to someone else. You know, and he didn't. And the longer you go thinking that negative, you know, thought, you'll, you'll come to believe it. And, it. and it makes sense why he's behaving in such a way. So, anywho, yeah, um, as you can tell, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. They've written the characters amazingly. Um, if you ever get the chance, check it out. This is the Mega Man comic series written by Archie Comics. American writers who are fans of the series are like the saviors for the lore and all these things. Now, I got a lot of people who recommend me to read uh, the Mega Mix, which is more of a manga uh, made in Japan. And it's supposed to be like darker and more edgy. And hopefully it's more edgy and dark. Like it's going to have to go the whole nine yards. Like, I mean, real dark. I mean, I, I need to see robots go maverick or just be evil and kill people. Like, that's what I'm going to have to see to sell me on that. Because this Archie Comics Mega Man series, it's got that campy feeling down. It's wholesome. It's friendly, friendly, but it's just a little bit edgy to where you can appreciate it. And all of the the narratives and, and plot points are pretty deep. And I like that. Case in point, though. No, no, no. Matter of fact, you can compare it to the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the DC Cinematic Universe. Where Marvel has the campy, family-friendly thing down packed with just a little bit of edge. So you're getting everything. It's a full course meal. You got your desserts. You got your savory. You got your sweets. And you got your good sides and a nice, decent drink. Whereas in DC, it's a big old heap of steak that you might not finish. So you need to take it home and finish the rest at another time. You know, because it's all one big thing consistently but i can't really use that comparison anymore because dc is getting better since the wonder woman movie but um let's not digress so back on topic yes um highly recommended if you're a fan of the mega man series go ahead and read that comic i'm almost done with it myself i think i've got about five issues uh done with the first part i believe i think it's like a two separate uh parts of it and um the one drawback though the one drawback and nitpick that I have with this series is they do crossovers with uh, the Sonic franchise, uh, series, uh, you know, running a comic book alongside it, the Archie Comics Sonic comic. And it is a very expensive comic, that Sonic comic. It's very, very expensive. It's like every single character you could think of in the Sonic verse is there. They're all involved. Blaze the Cat, Silver the Hedgehog, all of them. And I know quite a bit about Sonic lore. 
but I'm not as interested in it as I am in Mega Man because one Sonic is plastered everywhere and it has devout cult followers of its material. Whereas Mega Man, Mega Man needs it more, you know, and, and I'm, I'm starving more for Mega Man content than I am for Sonic content. So um, moving on from there, let's have a good time to talk about what I've been playing this week. Now, I want to open up with the first we can finally close the chapter on Hollow Knight. Yes, I finally finished Hollow Knight. Um, it was an amazing experience. Uh, I streamed it live to um, those who caught the stream. And those who did not, the VOD should still be up. But um, I will include some of the footage from my uh, last uh, few hardest fights that I experienced uh, toward the end of the game. Um, very, very rewarding series. Amazing game. I won't say series because we don't know. But, well, yeah, because they're coming out with Silk Song. But it's an amazing premise. Amazing art. It had amazing music. Everything was top-notch. It was, as a Metrovania and... The, the fact that considering that it's an indie game made by very few people and it's their first go at it and they only charge $15 for a full price. I got it on sale, but the full price is only $15. The fact that they did that, I have to consider giving this a nine and a half out of 10. This game is expansive. It is huge. I literally only i didn't know fooling around and, and messing around i mostly did exactly you know objective based exploring and you know curiosity sake gaming and i ended up with a save file over 100 hours crept up on me like a good drink like it, it was it just hit me all of a sudden and I'm, i looked at my save file when i said huh 100 hours that's crazy okay that's nice and I've, you know, in, in Metroid, Metroid, you gonna teeter about maybe if it's your first time playing Metroid, you might pull a good 20, you know, 20 hours on a Super Metroid, 20, maybe, maybe 25, depending on the person, you know, because you, you do a lot of backtracking, trying to find out some things and not everything is spelled out for you in that game. But Hollow Knight, easy to understand, very low learning curve very accessible to all types of people but the skill ceiling is infinite it's insane how infinite that skill ceiling is so there's a lot to master a lot to experiment with and it's it's cool especially with the charms so my my whole thing and how i ended up with a 100 100 hour uh game file was basically because i went for getting all the charms I wanted to defeat all of the Coliseum trials and basically do all the side quests that I could. And I was successful. I got like a 100, was it 104% completion upon beating the final boss, the true final boss? I think it was 104, something like that. But uh, yeah, amazing game. And I enjoyed myself thoroughly and immensely it's making me i've been itching to play me some castlevanias but now i realize why i haven't uh, played castlevania uh dawn of sorrow yet is because i i'm all was already playing a metrovania for like almost two months because if anybody's been following the podcast i've been playing hollow knight for about a couple months and this is the same save file still going at it still trying my best to beat it Got right down to the um the path of pain which you all saw last week and it's, it's an amazing piece of work it's, it's it's amazing considering what it is in context i give hollow knight a nine and a half when we have to compare it against others in its genre i can't compare it to other indie games because that wouldn't be fair it blows other indie metrovanias out of the water completely there's no other indie metrovania that can measure up to hollow knight that i can think of off the top of my head like the only one that could come closest may be axiom verge but axiom verge had its own share of problems and i'll probably talk about it later as well because i have played it but um i'll give a good short review on it another time well, well how would i remember 
Okay, let's let's make it quick. Basically, in my opinion, Axiom Verge was very smart. It was very intuitive, great music, and cool visuals as well. Um, everything felt right and it played right. But most of the collectibles, I I understand they tried to make a lot of the findable uh, collectibles uh, to be meaningful. And outside of the lore tidbits, I didn't find much interest in finding all those weapon upgrades. They didn't feel at all a necessity. Each weapon upgrade in Metroid is necessary for progression or just for your own player agency or to like give the character more avatar strength. And that's the purpose of his implementation. Meanwhile, Axiom Verge has like 30 different weapon upgrades. And you only need about eight of them to get through the game. <laughs> like, So, you know, but uh, I didn't really have much of an incentive to go back and complete it. Because I said I wanted to 100%. It. I have all of the lore uh, pieces of paper or, or, or documents or whatever that you can read on the lore that's in the different language until you uh, decode it and etc. But... After that, I was satisfied. <laughs> like I was like, I don't want to go back and find all this stuff that I'm not going to use. I've already, I already have other weapons that I've mastered, and they work much better for every single enemy type. You know, down pack in my head. So it's like, nah, I don't really want to. But you know, hey. But yeah, this is it's a decent Metrovania. A solid seven and a half. That's my opinion on Axiom Verge. But um, beyond that, okay. So um, in other news what i've been playing this week was um i finally got the chance um to catch dark souls dlc on sale for about i think it was like 12 13 bucks and i've played dark souls 3 for about ugh, I've, I've had it since like uh, 2019 summer which is my first time finally getting into it because uh keep in mind um my my road down the soul series was uh pretty weird my first souls game was demon souls then i went from demon souls directly skipped over everything else and went straight to bloodborne i was late to the party as you can you know as you can tell now with dark souls 3 it's very middle of the road between bloodborne and dark souls 1 and a lot of fan service in between and i don't mind that that being said it's still a good piece of art. I love the story. I love the characters. It's all great. I've studied it to the T. And um, now I've finally been able to play the DLC. So, And funny story behind the DLC. I have a friend, a great dear friend of mine, who saw me. He saw me streaming Jojo Bizarre Adventure Eye of Heaven, Eyes of Heaven about a couple, couple weeks ago, maybe a week ago. And... It was so f it's it's an it's a fun arena fighter. It's very interesting. It's very cool, especially for JoJo fans. But number one, the online is dead, and number two, we just realized the hard way that you cannot play online outside of your nation. The, the online matchmaking is region locked, and that is ridiculous. And this game came out what twenty seventeen. How dare you make a game at this day and age and do it in that fashion? Like, come on, man. You wrong for that. So, well, here we are pissed off because he got the game as a birthday present. I guess it was a gift out of request so that he could play with me. And it warmed my heart so much. So, I said, no, nah, I got to fix this. I tell you what. Because he, because it was about a month or two ago. When we first met, that he was like, uh, it would be really cool if we could play Dark Souls 3 together. And I said, okay, let's do that. But then we ran through the base game, and I helped him get to the um, to the Nameless King boss fight. And walked him through to get to it. But he had the DLC, and I didn't. So... That was the divide, and I was kind of sad that I couldn't join him, but we can bro op it up, you know. And I said, huh, his birthday just passed, and the DLC's on sale. This is great. I know exactly what to do. So I, despite my, you know, my cheap nature, I bust out the card and said, let's get it. And I'm enjoying myself, actually. And I'm not going to progress any further until he and I can co-op again. 
and we'll just keep it at that because it was it was a fun time you know plain and simple you know just just to be honest and i don't want to complete it without him so and it's completely against my programming because i'm the type that likes to go through a souls game once solo base level no new game plus and then come back with co-op i mean i've proven myself to be a good souls player enough since i've soloed every single other character enemy and boss in the other games and after fighting calumet i mean come on that ought to be an achievement in itself so yeah be okay um all in all i think i say all in all too much but um self-reflection aside <laughs> good game hopefully we'll be able to finish the ring city uh sometime this week we've already beaten the painting of ariamis or ariandel as they call it now but uh it's a pretty cool area uh i'm glad i never spoiled myself on it after all these years it's an amazing piece of work and i enjoy it um another game that i've been playing this week that i want to share with you all and this one's been a long time coming. I know some people are going to look at me crazy and sideways for never had playing this game. But Shadow of the Colossus is a masterpiece. And it still holds up to this day. I remember as a young Babby Slim seeing that game on ps2 and when it released i didn't have a playstation 2 i had a gamecube now not to say i wasn't disappointed with my gamecube i enjoyed many of the titles but when i looked over at the playstation sometimes man sometimes like there were moments where um where you uh when say try being a naruto fan which it was cool to be a naruto fan before shippuden came out and like ruined it but try being a naruto fan and having a GameCube during that time. And you got to go to school. And you see these other people with PlayStation 2s. You have Clash of Ninja. And you're like, oh man, I got Clash of Ninja. The Naruto, I got the latest one. It's got Rock Lee and he can open the eight gates. And he like teleport all in the air when he does the Hidden Lotus. And it's, it's cool. And then it was like, Pfft. I had that in the first Ultimate Ninja. In the new Ultimate Ninja, you could do everything. They even got Hokage. Like, what? You can play as Hokage? Yeah. And I'm like, son, this is insane. So it's it's it was one of those moments, you know. Now, mind you, that doesn't make Ultimate Ninja better. Because Ultimate Ninja was cheap as hell. It was easily breakable. Cyber Connects fighters usually boil down to fan service material first, video game balance fifth. Not even second, because in every single Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm or Ultimate Ninja, it was easily you could break the game and the meta was all out of balance. So if you played in the original Ultimate Ninja, all you needed was Itachi and Abuse Water Clones and Rasengan's or Chidori's. Um, you could just abuse um, Neji very heavily in the ultimate ninja series as an assist put him where he done i think i mentioned this before and just use somebody with range that um combos with uh ranged items and attacks and all types of stuff like that so that should be apparently um obvious but it's not exactly a bad thing it's just that's where their focus is more on transporting the raw source material over into the game visually and animation wise because i didn't have access to shadow of the colossus i had to look at a bunch of uh, material on youtube and this is when youtube was still kind of fresh like we're talking 2008 2007 2008 2009 youtube very very early 144p videos like way back in the day and naruto back then it was a unanimous replacement for dragon ball because gt was around and all the five people enjoy gt so naruto easily usurped the master when it came to the shonen and 
you know, everybody was on it, so to speak. And it sometimes would feel kind of lackluster to, you know, be over there with your GameCube while everybody else on their PS2s with their titles. When they were getting stuff like Jack and Daxter, Grand Theft Auto, and Ratchet and Clank, and all these other things, you know. So, hopefully, um, I was I was kind of worried that I wouldn't be able... I was hoping that the game aged well, <clears throat> and I'd still be able to enjoy it all the way up to 2020 seeing as this game is more than what it's about almost 15 17 years old i think this game is it came out like 2004 2003 something like that something along those lines but uh yeah this is a title way way back it was probably like 2000 yeah probably like 2004 2003 but um I will say that uh, I enjoyed myself. It's um, one of the things I will say is it was kind of easy considering that every game, like this game was so influential that almost every other uh, single player game copied its mechanics for fighting a Titan or some type of Colossus. The freaking Colossus, it's it, the mechanics are very good and it's bare bones. And it's all fundamentals, which is great for gameplay like that because it's our style. It's supposed to be slightly minimalist, but completely not exactly metaphoric either. But, you know, it's it's on the uh, brink of just being an expressive art. You know, you get to know as much as you need without voice lines and dialogue just through visuals, music and animation and art style. So that's what that's what makes it so enjoyable. Um, I will say that uh, another nitpick I have with it is the um, the health system being kind of arbitrary because you're supposed to upgrade them with the lizards and collecting the lizards. So it's more of a thing to do and collect rather than uh, um, a mandatory thing to forward your progression. Because you could defeat every Colossus as you are without any upgrades. And you automatically get stamina upgrades every time you defeat a Colossus. So, yeah. Um, it's It wasn't a um, bad experience like at all, though. Uh, overall, it was elating, actually. There were some scenes that were still amazing thanks to the texture updates and lighting and everything else. So, I enjoyed myself thoroughly. Um... The story isn't exactly cut and dry clear, but it's not complicated either. It's just a little, you know, a few tidbits missing here and there just to give you enough so you can ponder it, which was well done. And um, I'm glad I finally got a chance to experience this Marvel on the PS4 of all things. So I liked it uh, still to this day compared to other single player games of its ilk. I'd have to give it about a. A solid eight, eight and a half, a solid eight and a half. Huh. I don't know. It almost deserves a nine because it set, it, it does what it sets out to do correctly and perfectly. It's challenging. It makes you think. The music is astounding. And it's a nice little sized game. It's not huge, but it's not small either. It's 16 Colossi to take down. It took me about two days of sitting sitting down and just, you know, going at it. I'll give it a nine. It achieves exactly what it sets out to do. And it's unique in its way. But because it's unique and different, it knows that. It's self-aware enough to make sure that it do, it's not intrusive and it's different. It's, you know, meaning it doesn't force you a big wall of a learning curve, a huge learning curve, just to be able to enjoy it just because it's different. So that's nice. And another game that I replayed and haven't replayed since like 2000 and freaking 10 or 11 was uh, Journey. I played Journey again for the first time in about nine years. And the game is still a masterpiece as well. I've been playing a lot of good artsy games lately. Like I, I realize that now, but 
yeah that that game is still beautiful for those who don't know i shouldn't have to explain this i'm not gonna explain journey i just can say you have to play it it's not long it's probably like what three or four hours long you're gonna enjoy yourself immensely and it's a great experience overall it's a work of art you you just gotta play it man you just gotta play it you just gotta play it (laughs) you just gotta play it and plus another reason i won't explain is because it's also free this week on playstation network so anybody who does not have it should have it moving on from the games that i've played this week let's get into the news and at the end of the podcast um i found another podcast channel while i was perusing on the reddit and they podcast about the same material that i do uh, pretty much but uh it's a pretty interesting thing overall and i find and you know they're a small channel like me as well but they had this one thing where they uh get people to ask them questions about the games that they play or ask them just you know pretty much any question uh per week you know so i find it interesting and since i don't exactly have a pool of people to pull questions from um i'm just gonna ask i'm gonna make it a challenge uh because i like the challenge that they had and i'm gonna put that at the end of the podcast so let's get into the news for the week now one of the main things that's been going on this week and it's been atrociously huge so i gotta tackle it first we have a huge situation with naughty dog and the last of us 2 where the game footage has been leaked and it's all over the internet if thing hits the internet, the rule is it cannot be deleted nor removed. It's always a copy of it somewhere, somewhere on somebody's hard drive, whether it's a server or on a home personal computer hard drive. So I'll go ahead and share my opinion on it as well, because I've looked and followed up on everything. I've saw the people who reported on it. I've seen people make videos about it. I've seen and read articles about it. I've been reading tweets and ultimately I, I look at it this way these spoilers were not forced on anyone okay you had to make the conscious decision to look at those spoilers therefore anybody who's disappointed with what they saw in those spoilers it is your own damn fault i don't feel sorry for you and if you have a problem with how i feel about it that proves why you're the idiot that clicked it in the first place all right this is how spoiler culture goes okay this is not the first game that has spoilers leak this is not the first time this has happened in history okay and everybody knows what spoilers are everybody understands spoiler culture therefore there's no way someone else could spoil it for you without you clicking it and deciding hey i'm gonna watch this it's your own damn fault you have no self-control it's on you okay there's no sympathy here on the slim podcast number one so now that that's out of the way number two the things that you've seen in the spoilers because i watched them myself and the things you've seen, you cannot judge the full game product based off of what you've seen. There's no context. We don't even know these characters, let alone their origins or their motives. Therefore, what you've seen could be 30 hours into the game or it could be the first three minutes. You have no idea. So that is even more in my opinion, because I've been seeing people going, now that I've seen these spoilers, I'm not going to buy the game or I'm not going to I'm going to boycott this game. Hey, everybody, don't buy The Last of Us Part 2. Are you out of your fucking mind? The point I'm making is if you're saying that you don't want to buy the game just because you saw spoilers, that is not at the fault of Naughty Dog, who, who spent the man hours and money to create this product. Okay. Therefore, you have no reason, no incentive at all or any justification to make them pay for what you did in your lack of self-control. 
Okay, we have people, literal employees that worked around the clock for the past several years. This game was announced like two or three years ago, dude. They've been working around the clock for like almost half a decade to bring this game to you. And you guys saw a collective of maybe 30 minutes of it. And suddenly you decide this shit is not for me. I'm going to need y'all to slap yourselves. And then go get some extra help and have three more people slap you again. Because that is asinine. And you should feel ashamed. It's bad and you should feel bad. You should not even consider yourself part of the gaming kingdom. You you should you should not even say that or, or, or adopt that title to your name. You're a fool. That's how I look at it. Okay. Now, beyond that, if you have a problem. And you think that they're doing I've, I've seen some people say that they're pushing like social justice agendas with the narrative and et cetera. And I don't. I. How do we know that? How can we prove this? Because Neil Druckmann, the most the most uh, the, that he's uh, made a fail on was the left behind DLC in the first game. And it wasn't a complete fail. It was just fail enough, fail enough to the point where it was a waste of DLC. I would rather see what Tommy was doing. I've said this before. I I understand that Ellie's gay and we need that type of representation because I agree. I'm a part of the LGBTQ community. But we don't need that in our game DLC. That's not the main focus of the game. It was nothing. There was nothing deeper in that entire plot of the DLC except for the fact that Ellie was not straight. If you want to do social justice, let's move away from that. And talk about the racial injustice that I've been seeing in video games. But I don't want to get into that right now. Because I don't want to make this this type of podcast about that. The point I'm making is... this It's blatant that what people are attacking it for is for all the wrong reasons. Because if they were truly trying to um, you know, fix social justice and, and make a statement and all that. Then they would be taking a different angle with it. Or being more careful with it. Or doing it properly. Like other series. Like... like the Uncharted, the way they did Uncharted was way better when it came to representation of all forms of people, I believe. I don't know if there was any um, LGBT characters in the Uncharted series off the top of my head, but I do know for a fact that the black characters in Uncharted are badasses, and I love it. They were great, and I think it took them until about the fourth one, but still, <laughs> it it was worth it. it oh man i'm trying to series is incredibly white now that i think about it but um if they wanted to do something inclusive show me some latinos give me a mexican give me a dominican show me some asians in your narratives there's no there there i haven't seen the game series has been the most inclusive of different people in my opinion is a game that has the least amount of gameplay in a series and it's the telltale walking dead series they had asians they had latinos they had mexicans they had whites they had blacks they had everything in this entire series from the comic to the show to the games and that and people enjoy it immensely therefore that's proof literal proof bruh that it's possible to write and still be inclusive for all people whether it's races and and um sexual preferences and genders so let's move on we don't want to get in too deep into it because like i say i don't completely disagree nor agree with the viewpoint of the sjw um you know what what they the term they use as the nazi crowds um, because they have points, they're just way too radical and ill-organized in how they go about it. That's how I feel about it. But, hey, it's fine. We're getting better with time. There's not really been any uh, meltdowns and outbreaks lately. And I even watched the video, but the reason this comes up is because uh, Neil Druckmann had a big announcement when he announced some of the concept art for some of the zombies in the last of us one was supposed to be a form of the virus that only infects women and he felt that it would have been sexist and he changed his mind because he saw some videos that anita sarkeesian aka the feminist frequency a woman that started the whole shit storm a few years back and how these things are connected to one another just baffles me but 
this is how we get here, you know. So now it's not really about video games anymore. Because video games are mainstream, it's more than it's art now. It's more of a platform to preach someone's gospel. So they teach the young minds that they want the world to be like this. So when those young minds get older, they'll impose and force their world to be like this that they have seen in this fictional narrative when they were younger. Anywho's, this is a problem. This is a problem, and people are overreacting. Some people are saying, "I, I won't actually. I won't even speak on the spoilers themselves. I'll keep away from that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep on moving." But this is my whole take on how everybody's been reacting to it, and we're just gonna get into the article now because that needed to be said. Um, that's valuable time on the podcast. I might have to edit a longer podcast, but I don't care. Now. Sony has said that they have identified the person that leaked the material and they said that it's not exactly an employee, but just a person that they will not disclose, which I find to be a smart move to make because as we've seen in the past, gamers can be very vindictive and tribal when it comes to finding somebody who hurt their precious world. I love my gamer family. I love you all. But y'all don't exactly make me proud every day. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, article over here at uh Evo Strix. Not only did they claim that um they will not release the name of said person, but they claim that they're gonna get to the bottom of it and find out exactly what's going on. So we're just going to have to um, hope that they can handle the situation, you know, well at that moment. And at the time of me reading that article, I was hoping that they were going to handle it well. It, it, I can't exactly say they handled it badly, though, but it could have been better, but it could have been way, way worse. And that was on May 2nd um, of that article, um, by the way, written by... J Nyla. And here we are on the 3rd of May, written by the same Arthur J Nyla. A follow-up saying that Sony is abusing copyright law to take down The Last of Us 2 leaks. And the whole shakedown about this is that they're saying that they're abusing the copyright law to get rid of the leaks and they're going through the Google algorithm overlords and more in order to remove anything that's even remotely in text says anything about the last of us two and the word leak anything about old joel and ellie and the word leak anything um that's been spoken through google voice recognition in these videos on youtube they've been taking down small channels big channels you know everybody related and even people who don't even share the leaks people who just discuss them you know and you know there's a lot of people you know getting up in arms and going crazy over it it's like oh why are they doing this to my channel and my stuff and And to be fair to be fair and 130 percent fair okay i don't feel bad for you idiots either Okay, everybody who was dumb enough to talk about, discuss or share leaks on your main Twitter account or your main everyday personal YouTube account or your business YouTube account, whatever it may be. If you are much of an idiot to do something like that, you deserve the backlash. The rules of the Internet is as thus leaking information of copyrighted material is completely illegal. Is completely illegal. There are embargoes, DCMAs, etc., that make sure that these people can protect their product and it can be released properly and on time. It affects the product sales immensely if it is leaked and out too early. Okay? This is plain and simple. From TV shows to movies to video games, we want the video game medium to be respected. In this world of media and then we keep doing stupid shit like this 
I don't feel bad for you idiots either. You say you are running a business. You say this is a professional YouTube channel. Don't do anything stupid like that. Okay, this is their IP that they spend millions and millions of dollars, hundreds and hundreds of man hours, thousands of man hours in order to complete for people to play on release day. And you want them to turn a blind eye because you decided to spoil their material that they worked hard for? Think about that for a change. They might work for, see, the, the biggest disconnect that we have is we keep thinking of these video game development companies as this big bad monster or this big wizard behind the curtain at the end of the road on Wizard of Oz. Like, you got to remember, there's normal people working for these people, bro. And these normal people are caught in the COVID-19 problem just as much as you are. And they're still trying to finish their jobs up and make sure this stuff gets done on time. And, and you want to do them that way? They have to get paid too. These people who are probably swimming in college debt from loans in order to finish their schooling just so they could get into the video game development field. And here you are bitching because you didn't have the sense enough not to leak sensitive material on your main accounts and have it attached to your name. You're an idiot. And I wouldn't blame you if Naughty Dog kept you on a blacklist and never sends you another review copy, free copy of anything, code for anything. Shit else. Sony themselves. Nothing else first party for any of these people. I don't feel bad for any of you shits. None of you. I don't care who you are. Even if you're some of my favorite YouTubers. You should know better. This is a profession. Treat it like one. This is the one of the few professions where we can be ourselves and openly act ourselves. But that don't mean act a damn donkey so i don't feel bad for none of y'all either now moving on from that mini rant let's be real here it doesn't matter if they're peddling an agenda it doesn't matter if they're peddling whatever it may be but there was no problem when the last of us one came out because they didn't make the agenda the whole crux of the story until the DLC. Have some faith and see if the game comes out properly. And if it turns out to be that way, I'm sure it's going to take less than a week to beat. If you don't like it, return it right back to GameStop. There's a 30 day return policy on new games, and used games have an even further return policy. So, especially if you buy the extended warranty. Yes, can you tell I used to work at GameStop? I was the manager. But the point that I'm saying is people are trying to throw their responsibilities on to other parties during this matter. And I don't respect it at all. Okay? In the future, if I make some type of mistake like this, then I brought it on myself. So, you know what I'm saying? But that, come on. What do you expect? I saw the leaks months ago. I saw these leaks weeks ago. I mean, say no, not months ago, but weeks ago. I saw these leaks weeks ago. And the most that I shared it was I copy and pasted in a personal private discord amongst me and some friends. Not a whole hundreds of people and thousands of people in the same server now. I shared it amongst about 10 people in one discord. Didn't copy paste it anywhere else. Nowhere else. Okay. For the main reason being that uh, I only have like one group of friends that really care about gaming in that sense. The other group is like it's <sighs> the black community is overrun with sports games that are not fun and just trash in general. But uh, yeah, back on topic, man, this is this this whole debacle, man. You can't even find the bad guy in it all because the people are acting like idiots. How are we supposed to blame Sony when you guys are doing exactly and getting what you deserve? Let's move on. Uh, over here on comicbook.com, we have an article by the author by the name of Tyler Fisher. Titled, PlayStation 5 Developer Explains Why Backwards Compatibility Feature Won't Include PS3, PS2, and PlayStation 1 Games. And um, to summarize this article, basically, well, I'll read the quote, actually. 
And um, the quote that he said here is, as a developer, however, I can see where some legal stuff could get blur a bit blurry, especially if the goal is to have these older games sold in some stores. Some companies don't exist anymore and licenses of those titles might not be so easy to figure out. I also understand that older consoles might have some form of hardware DRM that could prevent newer consoles from reading older discs. To be honest, I just wish backward compatibility wasn't a novel thing and just an expected feature covering all titles. So case the the whole thing the the cut and dry thing is that it's a legal matter and hardware propriety matter matter like when it comes to these uh drms that they use in order to ensure that other games and other discs are not used in your playstation 4 therefore once they once you make the game and you burn it on a blu-ray for the playstation 4 it has to also have it be written on that disc that a key so to speak to make it readable on a playstation 4 they've been using this method of hard drive um excuse me um disk drive drm since the playstation i want to say probably the one since the one but especially it hasn't been uh as sophisticated as since uh the two and three and main reason was because one of the first disc based cd based uh you know see the one of the first game consoles that used cd media was the dreamcast okay and it was huge but it hurt sega immensely because there was no disc drive drm therefore you could literally just take a game pop it in your windows xp copy it burn it and take that raw burned copy and pop it right into a Dreamcast and it'll work perfectly. You had no need to patch, edit anything, soft mod, anything. You just copy it, burn it, play it. That is a huge problem, especially in this day and age. You know, blank Blu-ray discs are readily available. I used to sell them, but these things are not new so i'm not exactly surprised their main thing most likely they're just saying that um you'll be able to play ps3 on downward with playstation now which is a service i don't exactly trust yet i've tried it once if you don't have a great internet connection it's going to be but like complete cheeks um because one of my favorite ps3 titles is sonic generations or you know well, Devil May Cry is on PS4 now, so that's not really an issue. But yeah, Sonic Generations is one of my favorite PS3 titles that has not been remastered or re-released on any other console since its, uh, in, you know, con since its creation and release. So, you know, if I don't have tight controls down to the frames, I can't enjoy that game properly. You you literally have to react in fractions of seconds. You know, it's it's just plain and simple. PlayStation Now just does not work how they want it to. Unless it was like, if they did PlayStation Now, if they revamped PlayStation Now and made it like the Xbox Game Pass, then I could consider that. But otherwise, no. And speaking of Xbox Game Pass, let me let me let me squeeze this in for the articles as well. So apparently, Xbox Game Pass, everybody's loving it, and it's been amazing. For PC players and Xbox One players alike. But the PlayStation equivalent being the PlayStation Plus, which gives you two free games per month. I gotta say, it's a good service. And I've been enjoying it for the past few years, but it ain't got shit on the Xbox Game Pass for one. And for two, they really, they really dropped the ball for the month of May. Like everybody it was a picture going around and everybody was getting debated you know and getting hyped thinking that oh you know it was listed that dying light and dark souls remastered was going to be the free games this month and everybody was all on board for that i saw it on twitter i was like yo for real because if that's the case i can bro up this remastered version of dark souls and that'd be great i get to play some you know get to fight ornstein and small i'll do a, a fourth playthrough of dark souls one hell yeah i would especially if i can co-op it Hell yeah, but 
guess what we got? Freaking, what was it? Farm Tractor Simulator and City Skylines? Ugh. We got Sim City and a simulator game. And it's not like one of the more interesting simulator games. Like maybe a Surgeon Simulator, maybe. I don't even if there's even I don't even know if they ported that over, but you know, it's 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 freaking farm tractor simulator. <laughs> Come on. So no. No, 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 no. But I'll add it to the library just for research sake. You never know in the future. I might need to do a review or some type of analysis on the game series or the game itself to, just to see what all the hoopla is about. Because those simulators make bank. And I don't know why. <laughs> I just don't know why. Um. So, yeah. <sighs> and, yeah. There we have it. Uh, PlayStation 5, set your expectations accordingly. Technology is still technology. And the first, the root word in it is tech. And it's very, very technical. So anyway, it's a technical science. Over here on GameIndustry.biz, we have an article written by Rebecca Valentine. And it is letting us, giving us the notification that Jeff Keighley, the Dorito Pope himself, is hosting a summer fest. To push and rally, uh, uh, to rally the industry. In light of the cancel of E3, he wants to hold an online summer fest where every all the big name studios and development companies can showcase their new games, demos, and releases that they have upcoming. So to speak, of a um, it's it's something that he tried to do before. But there was, you know, E3 is such a tradition at this point that you can't exactly, you know, overthrow it right now. But um, it's basically meant to be somewhat of a press conference, but online, I assume, because of COVID. And the inclusion of this little summer festival have names like 2K... Activision, Bandai Namco, Bethesda, Blizzard, Bungie, CD Projekt Red, Digital Extremes, Electronic Arts, Microsoft, Sony, Square Enix, Private Division, Riot Games, Steam, and Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment. And I'm actually surprised at some of these names that are included. Uh, so we're hopefully going to see a lot of things. Uh, I don't see Ubisoft included. So maybe everything that they wanted to show was in their latest trailer for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, but maybe they'll get on board in time. Nintendo's not listed, but maybe they'll get on board. Um, but, you know, they've been, you know, skipping E3 for the past several years and just doing the Nintendo Treehouse. So maybe there's going to be something along the lines of that. But. Keep in mind that this is supposed to be not exactly E3, but a diet E3 or E3 light. So, hey, let's see. Hopefully, my, what I imagine is going to be like uh, the natural evolution of how it was always with E3 for the past several years where they would go you know around the xbox 360 and ps3 era they started you know just live prepping things on the servers so it can be prepared for everybody you know they'll just go and announce it and like here's the trailer for our new game and then boom see the trailer trailer ends and he goes yes this game will be available during the christmas holiday of this year but guess what players can enjoy it and get a preview of that game very soon how soon we talking they can play a demo of the game right now. So go ahead, fire up your servers, everybody, and download this demo and play the game. You know, and we're going to have a lot of that, you know, throughout the entire. It's, it's most likely that's one of what is going to be it. Because um, if you're going to do it online like that, it's going to have to be somewhat interactive with the audience. So everybody could get a hold of, uh, you know, what what else is going to be going on. So it, it's it's that's going to be the most useful thing. In my opinion but here's to hoping you know because me personally i'm a, I'm a, a game consoles buying a brand new i've never been that type of guy ever 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 and even when it comes to buying brand new releases come on man that's a that's a huge investment per month buying games brand new and you don't even know if it's good or bad yet i'd rather wait 
And when you wait, the price drops. You get to get rid of your backlog in the meantime. And you can actually afford to do so. And when it comes to consoles, it takes longer for it to get good games. The PlayStation 4 didn't have any good games on until about two, maybe three years into its existence. So I was fine with grabbing a PS4 around 2016. But you can't expect the PlayStation 5 to have all these blockbuster big hitters on release and still be able to do it without taking out a, a mortgage, you know, and taking out a loan on your mortgage or something like that. So it's it's not it's not in the cards. Unless we get to that point, unless this channel grows to that point and we end up getting like the PlayStation 6, you know, on release just so I can show it to you guys and unbox it and let everybody see what it's like, etc., then fine. But um, at the moment, I'm just going to have to be myself and say, ain't in the budget. So, <laughs> moving on. Uh, looking forward to that little game fest, whatnot. Um, in other news, we, we couldn't, we wouldn't have a podcast without some Valorant news because I love me some Valorant. I've been watching me some gameplay all week. But um, let's not forget that the closed beta for Valorant is still active. It's still not a full release game and they're still having problems with cheaters. And it seems that the anti-cheat software, firstly, can be turned off. Okay. Meaning that you would have to, you cannot turn it off while the game is running. You would have to restart the game in order to turn it back on. And um, it has to be active while the game is running. But it still allows people for the comfort purposes of their um, device security. You can turn it off. Um, I am not against this decision completely but i do find it to be a dumb move at this point because now it shows even more vulnerability with its upkeep and gives you know black hat hackers more to work with um but despite that i believe this was done for a uh, um quality of life change to make people more comfortable but either way um riot just it's just most of the article is just riot trying to convince people that they've uh development for their personal privacy in mind and at the highest priority which i don't exactly doubt but uh we'll see moving forward um there's also been an influx of cheaters on valorant as well where it's escalated in the same sense of uh, like Batman Begins, Dark Knight Rises, etc. When um, Gordon was uh, talking, I think I, I think I called this too. I think I called it in last week's podcast that there might be escalation where you, you know, have one answer that's bigger than the rest of the problems. Well, the problems find another answer to your answer that's bigger than your answer. And then it just goes on and on and on as escalation swing a punch another punch comes back three punches returned then five then two people then a gun <laughs> you know like there's escalation so um there's been wall hacks and, and aim bots appearing and uh there's even been some people they caught a streamer using some type of uh bug where they could um see through venom smoke gas and just uh, be able to abuse that and uh that's a problem but uh they said it's easy to detect so they advise the people not using it or else it'll result in a ban so there's another huge ban wave coming most likely and there's a lot of white hat hackers that are releasing these hacks in order to help patch up the security for the game. So even though this seems like a very bad shit show, this might be the most efficient beta I've ever witnessed. Like they're literally getting the kinks out. <laughs> like they're fixing the game before release and it's just happening live before us rather than behind the scenes. So that's comforting. Oddly, it's comforting. In other news, Cyberpunk 2077 gets an R18 plus rating in Australia, alleviating fears of a ban. I have a friend who lives in Australia 
and they are pissed at the index when it comes to uh, game pricing and censorship. So there's a lot of games that they want to play but can't play, and I actually feel bad for them. It's a shame, really, because there's no reason to outright ban them if you have a rating system implemented, you see. Because the main thing that they got to realize is it's not going to save anything. If the person wants a product or wants something, they're going to be able to get a hold of it. You could still order it through Amazon. You could still order a copy and play it. The the PlayStation 4's disk drive is not region locked. Okay? PlayStation never region locked their disk drives. Ever. So, nothing stopping them from buying an American copy of a game. Just as much as people on a daily basis buy Japanese uh, games and then play them here in North America. So that's the dumbest thing. If anything, I, I believe it's hurting the uh, that could potentially help uh, with economic. Um, there could be some economic help there if they were allowed certain games sold there. But uh, who cares? I care. And it's a shame that they had to go through that. Just to miss out on something so little for something so petty. Um, and, but still, with the R18 Plus rating, they don't have to worry about the game being banned. So Cyberpunk will be available in Australia. So congratulations to you guys. I am glad for you. Because The Witcher 3 is one of those amazing games that really should be included. But most games that end up with the uh, ban are mostly included with the use of drugs and it's one of the reasons why we happy few and other games listed in the article got banned in australia i don't know if the witcher 3 got banned or not because the potions were um, there was an entire mission about getting high in the game so i don't know but um hey there's also a Blizzard co-founder believes accessibility has made World of Warcraft less social, which is a super interesting read. Uh, personally, this is the type of stuff that I love to watch. I've watched an entire TED talk about this. Uh, there was a guy who um, designed MMOs and he used to research other MMOs and find out what it's like for players in their first time experiences or veteran MMO players, etc. And MMOs originally were made to be social games. They were meant to be incredibly difficult. So the only way to overcome those obstacles of difficulty was teamwork. But sadly, as the days go by and the years pass, um, games have become more and more accessible <clears throat> for a lot of reasons. And accessible is just a PC version of saying it's becoming more casual. And I say that's PC version because the word casual is almost a curse word at this point. It's almost an insult at this point. But um, you can't exactly fight against casualization. I personally used to, uh, am a hard Devil May Cry stand, And I used to be one of those toxic, virile people who's just like, no, this is for casuals. Y'all got to do better or you know things like that. But it came from a good place because as a community, ultimately, we just wanted people to try harder at games so you could find the true fun and the deeper mechanics but um nine times out of ten the average person or user would just be satisfied by watching the credits roll because they beat the game on easy or normal at least you know and we would want to you know with this those games with the old school design um philosophies would really rather you try harder and improve so that you can appreciate it on a deeper level um so here we are with the same, essentially, fundamentally the same discussion when it comes to World of Warcraft. Personally, I have not played World of Warcraft, but I was around during its, you know, creation and all through its fandom and everything. I almost started to play it, but changed my mind. Um, Blizzard, basically, they've changed the game to be more accessible. So that way, even people, one of the reasons why casualization is on the rise in accessible games with a low skill floor. Um, are popular and the main go-to when it comes to design choices is because it's not just people who are new to the games but also people who 
work jobs or are doing other things and are busy most of the time and finally get an off day, they get to a game and they haven't touched the game for maybe like two weeks, maybe to a month. So they would have to relearn how to play it all over again. So it's better to make an easier game where it is it's very accessible and easier to get into it rather than something that you have to master all over again. And that's what's most popular these days are low skill floors but high skill ceiling designs. That being said, when it comes to World of Warcraft, um, it became incredibly more casual. I think after Mr. Pandera or something like that, some one of those updates. And um, it just now got back to the classic um, actual difficulty when they made um, Warcraft classic world of warcraft classic or something like that the re-release that they just recently had of the original world of warcraft and there's been people all into it they've been jumping back in they've been loving it and that's part of the beauty of it because if you team up with people you co-op for an example um if anybody has played any mmo um that's not exactly difficult but you had like harder boss fights at some points or harder raids at some points. Those are the most memorable moments when it's something huge and difficult that you and your friends overcame or you and a bunch of strangers. Those are the most memorable moments. And that's the feeling that MMOs are meant to give you. But when it comes to Destiny, I can't exactly speak on it, but I, I find it hard to believe that that type of uh, experience is had in that game. <laughs> but... um. Yeah, moving forward. It's a very interesting um, article, and there's even a video of them two discussing it, the co-founder uh, with the interviewer, and it's actually pretty deep and in-depth, and I like the, the the those little intricate things. It gives more of an insight of how our games are made for us, by us, you know, because well, these games can't be made well without them being made by gamers, so think about that next time you want to, you know, rise to arms and you know, crusade against these companies and these developers, man. They're gamers just like us. It's just sometimes they just might be a different gamer from us. So, yeah, let that sink in. I know it's mind-blowing. I know I shattered your world. But anyway, yeah, so the um, interview being Mike Morhame, Morhame, I hope I didn't butcher your name. Sorry, Mike. Um, Down here, we'll call you Mike Mo. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Had a good talk with the co-founder of Blizzard about that. And um, when it comes to online experiences, let's be honest, the most dominant one right now is the Battle Royale experience amongst the kids. So when it comes to like statistics and doing quests and things like that, kids don't really just get roped up in that type of immersion. Um, but moving on, that's a very good read and a good watch if anybody's interested in the, that type of detail when it comes to game design. So ultimately, um, I hope I wasn't too intense with the rants. I might have to make a separate video altogether about this, but uh, <laughs> oh well. Hey, I'm I'm still trying to think. I don't want to increase my workload too much, but if I do, I want it to be a good series that you guys would enjoy, and it's easy for me to produce, so that way I won't have to overdo it. But, um, yeah. Okay, here's the challenge that I got from the other podcasters uh, that I found. It was a question over there on that podcast, but I'm going to use it as a challenge. And basically, the question was to name one thing I hate in my favorite single player game. And I'm going to do a little twist to it. And I'm going to name one thing I hate in my favorite single player game and one thing I love in a video game I hate single player game I hate so let's get into it um the one thing the my favorite single player game it's hard to choose because it's between Mega Man X Super Metroid and Devil May Cry 3 for the sake of modern depiction I'm gonna pick Devil May Cry 3 and I'm gonna say the one thing I hate about Devil May Cry 3 was um that sniper rifle weapon that you get in the special edition being completely useless 
<laughs> either it is kind of a, a low hanging fruit so if anybody that's a fan of the game or the series um if you don't like that answer then the only other thing i will say that i can say i hate about it was um oh the one thing i hate i know now when you're inside the leviathan that stage on hell or hell difficulty or heaven or hell difficulty where you die in one hit and the stomach acid all over the ground in various areas that's bullshit <laughs> all right and um one thing i love about a game that i hate um what's the game that i hate uh fortnite one thing i love about it they get some of the coolest updates and it's not fair <laughs> some of their updates and things and events that they have are just astounding which there's an interesting one or oh, more mechanically interesting right now apex which is the most has been fun in a long time where everybody has a set um a set amount of armor like you you everybody has a default default armor uh only level one was like a few days ago and um right now they're doing only level two armor for everybody by default when you spawn no matter if you respawn or initially spawn you have level two armor so and that makes the game flow like amazingly well like it feels like better halo <laughs> oh, oh let me watch my mouth um it feels like better halo like I'm going around killing people and I'm shooting them the appropriate amount of times in order to kill them. And it feels good, you know? So, yeah, having a good ass time. <laughs> um, all right, people, this one's a doozy. I'm going to see if I can edit this down because as of right now, I'm looking at the time marker for the recording and we are well past like an hour and a half so i'm going to narrow this down some of the rants i might remove and just put them in a separate uh video or something but um or just make like a um, podcast um what's the word i'm looking for not uncut or behind the scenes but um deleted scenes or something like that yeah so we'll probably do two two different videos but um yeah all in all <laughs> Let me hurry up and close this out before it gets any longer. So, everybody, I hope you enjoy your weeks. Play you some games. Stay safe. Do what you can. And, ooh, excuse me. Do what you can. And don't overdo yourself. And always remember the channel motto. Intentions are the most important. Actions ain't nothing but loud. And words don't mean a damn thing. Love yourselves. Take care. Over me, I mean, where this woman took over with me, over with me, over with me, I said over with me.